Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Turvey. I'm President and Executive Director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's JTalks live webcast, Ecosystem Builders, the first of a two-part series spotlighting new startups. You can catch the second event, The New Wave, this Thursday at the same time. Thank you for joining us for these important conversations exploring the future of journalism. We're grateful for the generosity of our exclusive JTalk series sponsor, TD Bank Group, for making these conversations possible. And our thanks also to our in-kind supporters, CPAC Incision. If you enjoy these talks and would like to support the work of the CJF, you can donate now or at any time on the CJF website. We're delighted to be back with you for a new fall season of virtual and in-person events. I have a few upcoming events to share and we hope you'll join us. On September 28th, World News Day celebrates journalism that makes a difference. The global campaign is presented by the CJF and the World Editors Forum. You can visit worldnewsday.org for details on how your newsroom can participate on a global stage and share your journalism that has made a difference. On October 4th, join us at the Toronto Reference Library's Appel Salon for Hockey Blight in Canada, an inside look at the media's role in bringing scandals to light in our national sport. And on October 20th, we are honored to have Lisa Laflamme join us for an evening of conversation at Kerner Hall. For ticket information and related details, you can visit the CJF website. Today's program is 60 minutes long and you can still submit questions for our stellar panel at any time via the tab on your screen. If you'd like to tweet about today's conversation, our hashtag is JTalksLive. And now onto our program. New startups have become a bright spot in a media industry struggling to adapt and survive in the digital era and post-pandemic environment. The group we welcome today lead outlets that are thriving by filling coverage gaps and developing local news ecosystems. Joining us from the Narwhal, please welcome co-founder, executive director, and editor-in-chief, Emma Gilchrist. From NAR City Media Group, co-founder and CEO, Chuck Lapointe. From Overstory Media Group, co-founder Farhan Mohammed joins us. And from Discourse Community Publishing, please welcome CEO Brandy Shire. They're in conversation with IndieGraph Media co-founder and CEO Aaron Miller, who has built a distinguished track record in the new startup space. It is an honor to have them with us today. And with that, Aaron, over to you. Thank you so much, Natalie. It is an honor to be here and thank you all for joining us. I wanna start by acknowledging that I'm calling in from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Slaver II peoples. The organizations that I work with seek to work in partnership with indigenous communities and journalist entrepreneurs to decolonize the media ecosystem and support indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. I was really pleased to see that you'd be featuring Indigenous News as one of the publishers in that talk. So to kick us off, I want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Aaron Miller, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of IndieGraph. IndieGraph is a network of small and startup community news outlets pooling resources to accelerate their growth. You can think of us a little bit like a Shopify for community news entrepreneurs. We were launched by the team behind the discourse in 2020 and have since helped 80 independent community news outlets across North America grow. So it's a real pleasure to introduce you to this inspiring group of news entrepreneurs in front of us. They are here to challenge the narrative that the news industry is dying. And I wanted to kick us off by sharing a few observations from the local news project research conducted by April Lindgren's team at the university formerly known as Ryerson University. Um, yes, there have been a lot of newsroom closures. Here in Canada, 244 in the last five. But when we only focus on that number, we overlook a huge part of the story. During that same period, 106 local news outlets launched. Most of those that were closed were owned by large newspaper chains that relied on print and advertising. The vast majority of the new outlets that have launched are digital and independently owned by small operators. Um, and this is not just a Canadian thing. We're seeing this happen uh, around the world. 
recently, the Lion Publishers, which is an uh, industry association based in the United States, did a, a piece of research that found that there are now over 800 independent local news outlets across North America and that their growth is accelerating. So think about that. Hundreds of journalists, entrepreneurs are coming to the rescue in communities, filling news gaps. They are why we need to reframe this narrative. This is not an industry that is dying. It's an industry that's undergoing a massive transition in ownership. And I think that that's a really exciting thing. This shift presents us with a generational opportunity to transform how local news is being done, community news, to be more trustworthy, responsive, and equitable. And with that, I'm going to, to pass it to our panelists. These are the folks that are rebuilding news and communities that have never had access. They are building in, bringing in-depth envir environmental reporting back to communities. This is inarguably the most critical beat of all after these, we've seen these reporters severely cut back in legacy media system. They are finding new ways to make money with advertising, with sponsored content, with grants, with membership. And what they all have in common is that they're making it work. So with that, I want to invite you each to introduce yourselves and your business, and let's just get straight into it. Can you specifically share how you are making money in this challenging media environment? Um, Emma, would you kick us off, please? Sure. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today and to share a little bit of how the Narwhal works. So we launched the Narwhal about four and a half years ago now. Um, and at that time, it was just me and my co-founder, Carol Linnett. So we just had two staff um, and our budget was about $400,000. And over the last four years, that's now grown by six times. So we're now looking at a budget of, a, of about 2.5 million. And we did that by basically throwing uh, the rule book for media out the window. Um, so we don't have any advertising. We don't have any owners. We don't have any shareholders. And we don't have a paywall. Um, so how, the, how the hell does that work? People often ask, um, basically it works by producing in-depth and investigative journalism about the natural world that people can't get anywhere else that clearly there's an appetite for. And then it's all a numbers game of getting a certain percentage of those folks to voluntarily pay for it. <clears throat> so we have about 5,000, uh, readers of the Narwhal who choose to pay for it. Um, on average, they pay about $13 a month. Um, we let people pay what they can. And interestingly, they choose to pay more than what they would pay if we told them what to pay. Um, we are Canada's first registered journalism organization, which is a designation reserved for nonprofit news organizations. And that means that everybody who gives to us gets a tax receipt. And our funding is basically half and half now between those small um, reader contributors and um, grants through foundations. So that's how we are making it work. And now we have grown to 23 full-time staff. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited for the conversation about how others can follow, follow in these footsteps. Thanks, Emma. Farhan. Hi, everyone. Uh, really pumped to be here. Um, I'm the I'm, uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO at Overstory Media Group. Uh, our story is very um, uh, similar to to Emma's, where we kind of threw the rule book out the window and we said, "How are we going to do this?" At Overstory, we build, we uh, acquire, and we create phenomenal community publications. And what that means for us is that we look at everything from three different lenses. Number one is local, number two is industries, and then number three is uh, niche interest. And we go into places all around the country and we find ways for us to connect with communities. And generally it starts with knowing that journalism is yeah, underfunded. Uh, we've got newsrooms that have, that have gone. Um, we have we have such a lack of reporting that's happening and we go in and we ask those questions that what do people actually want and what do they need in their lives and understanding that everyone has so many different uh, different communities that they're a part of and we go in and, and effectively we're trying to unbundle the newspaper and and give people these these different points uh, throughout their day. Uh, we center around newsletters and so one of the ways that we make money is through newsletter advertising and sponsorships um in my past i was the editor-in-chief and co-owner at daily hive and everything we were doing was focused on advertising and i think the past couple of years have really shown that 
that's a that's a way to uh, to set yourselves up for a lot of difficulties. Um, and so what we've tried to do is look at it and say, okay, we have all of these different sort of people all over the place. We have all these like really specific communities that you probably haven't even heard of, which is totally okay. Uh, what is it they what they want? What do they need? Let's start to build different pieces around that. Um, and so we start with the newsletter and we look and say, okay, what's the next thing you need? Uh, maybe you need in-person experiences. Uh, maybe you want to help pay. So, so the model right now is a, is a little bit all over the place because not everything is the same. We don't have a cookie cutter. Everything is unique. Everything is custom. Uh, and so we've got some that are majority advertising. We've got some that are reader revenue and paid memberships. We've got some that are on events um, and then a whole bunch of different pieces uh, along the way. Uh, today, where we've got, I think, about 15 different publications around Canada, primarily in Western Canada. We've got over 50 full-time staff about two thirds of which are editorial uh, journalists. So that's a little bit about us. Thank you, Farhan. Chuck. Hello. Uh, all right, so I'm a bit uh, different in regards to we make uh, most of our money through ads uh, and we love it. But uh, so we are uh, an RCD media group. Uh, we launched in Canada in 2013. Uh, we launched in Montreal and then expanded to Toronto in 2014. Uh, we are now in six core markets across the country. We target primarily 18 to 49, um, and we uh, are essentially about 110 full, full time staff now. Uh, our business works in kind of two different buckets. The first is the content division, where their objective is to create local news and travel content, mostly short form, but we do do some uh, long form and we just try to essentially maximize uh, the information that we can give while also entertaining them and making sure that we engage with our people where they actually read their news, which is social and search. Um, and then we have the second bucket where um, we define that as the media sales and the media sales division makes most of their revenue through branded content. Uh, what that means is essentially we work with tons of brands all across the country to create 360 types of activations with brands that can include a uh, custom video series, uh, social first activations, sponsored editorials, and a bunch of uh, other things. Um, but for us, essentially, the way that we grow our business is we just try to reach as many users as we can, making sure that they're engaged. Uh, and the more we can do that, the more we can collaborate with brands and the more we can reinvest into original reporting across our different markets. Uh, so we see that as a business cycle. That's pretty much it. Thank you, Chuck. And Brandy, I'll let you. Hello, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here to talk shop with everyone. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I'm the CEO of Discourse Community Publishing, and this morning I'm joining you from the unceded and traditional territories of the Shaquetma peoples. Um, we have about four different outlets that we operate. Of course, the Discourse, which is uh, primarily focused on Vancouver Island. We have Indigenous, which is um, Indigenous-led and focuses on the Okanagan, Vancouver Island, and a little bit into the Lower Mainland. Uh, we have Sun Peaks Independent News, which operates in the resort community of Sun Peaks in British Columbia's interior and is actually celebrating 20 years of uh, community news uh, this year. And then we've recently launched the REN, which is uh, based in Kamloops, and we just started publishing this spring. Uh, so when it comes to how we do it and our revenue models, we're really a hybrid type of operation. Um, but I will say that reader support is really at the heart of everything that we do and is um, kind of key to how we connect with our communities and serve them. We do also do not believe in a paywall. We think that uh, local news should be accessible to everyone. We use... Um, a lot of grant and foundational sponsorship. We've accessed funding through the federal government through the local journalism initiative. We also work with newsletter sponsorships with value aligned partners to help support our work. Um, and in Sun Peaks, we actually have some traditional print advertising going. So we really have a mix and it's, um, yeah, every community is a little bit different and uh, it's always kind of working to see what works best in different situations. Awesome. Yeah, one theme that I've heard um, from you all is um, 
um, is, is just that importance of putting the audience first, um, whether that's because you're putting membership at the heart of your business model or because engaging and, and um, reaching those audiences um, is key to how you work with, with your customers uh, on the advertising side. And so um, I just had a couple follow-up questions about that and maybe Emma, I'll put this to you. Um, in terms of your 50-50 revenue, 50% 50 of your revenue coming from the readers, 50% coming from brands, would you say that that audience revenue piece is important to why foundations support you too? Um, what is the value proposition that you put in front of um, your grant funders? I know that these folks are, you know, probably comparing supporting the Narwhal to, you know, supporting direct action on environment, uh, climate action or supporting other causes. So what is it that compels them to get involved with journalism? And, and yeah, and is re your reader support track record important? Yeah, that's such a good question. It definitely is very important. I think all foundations are looking for projects that won't need to be funded forever, right? They don't want to fund something that doesn't have a, you know, sustainability plan for the long term. And so we're able to kind of pitch to foundations that if they support a position for the first few years, for instance, and give us that runway to get it going, that in that time, we can build the, the reader support to continue to support that position. Um, and, you know, the whole kind of nonprofit funding model is very centered around impact, right? So you get to sort of remove some of the more traditional inclinations of media, which is, you know, to be in like kind of constant competition with one another. And for us, it's really just like we want to produce great content and get it in front of as many people as possible. So that's led to some really cool partnerships coming about of late, like recently through the Winnipeg Community Foundation, um, we got funding for a reporter that shared with the Winnipeg Free Press. And so all of that reporter's um, stories are published both in the traditional print publication in Winnipeg, and then also online in the Narwhal, which is, you know, really just helping, I think, like, the the bucks for journalism go further, right? Because we all know that there's, there's limited amount of money for this stuff. And it's like, how do we actually use that to create the biggest impact possible? Unmuted. There we go. Brandy, you mentioned that uh, that membership and reader revenue is a part of what you all do and you try a million things. Can you just explain why? And also, like, in terms of revenue into the future, like, what are you most excited about right now in terms of, like, innovating new models? Um, I think that the reader support and the reader revenue um, just really gets me coming from a very community news um, perspective. And when COVID happened, I was working in Sun Peaks and, um, you know, 90% of our print advertising fell out from underneath us. And it was really the readers that responded and actually showed that they valued the work that we were doing in the community and stepped up and helped us get through that really rocky time. And I think that we're seeing, you know, more and more Canadians are realizing that they are going to have to pay for news and they, you know, if they can afford it, um, you know, potentially they should pay for news that they value and especially news that, you know, is doing things differently, is helping to serve, um, you know, historically communities that maybe haven't been centered in media. So with this kind of like permission and support from the audience, we can kind of, um, start to experiment more and more with the types of stories that we're able to tell. And it really just gives independent media kind of like a new um, ability to, to do what we're trying to do. So I think that, you know, reader support is um, for me, something that I would love to see grow within our business. Um, I love to hear that the Narwhal is at that 50% point. I think that that is like a really important milestone and something that we're endeavoring to do as well. So I think that that's kind of what excites me the most about innovation, um, but also the opportunity for companies and organizations to get involved who are value aligned as well. And I think that um, if you look at, you know, traditional advertising and journalism values, we're getting into like some gray areas there. But I think that that's exciting and that we should be having transparent conversations about that. And um, it's an opportunity for everybody to get involved and to support something that they value. So I think that's really where I'm at these days. Thanks, that's a great transition to, uh, to invite Chuck back into the conversation as well. Um, you were talking about how important sponsored content is. 
Um, and, you know, how does that, again, what is the, the main value proposition that you're putting to those brands? And what are kind of the most important metrics to demonstrate that you do have this like deep audience engagement at this point? Is that changing from what it used to be? Yeah, uh, so definitely, I would say uh, when we started branded content back in 2013, everything was geared around Facebook and how much reach you can get on Facebook and what's the viral effect that you can get for brands. And I think that we really excelled well there. Um, and we were able to partner with brands into telling their story in a much more engaging way uh, than they could do themselves. Um, and then we were sort of amplifying that on social and being able to deliver a message that engage a lot of people. Uh, I think that's totally different now. I think that uh, the way that Facebook promotes stories is definitely not the same as it used to be. Um, getting awareness around the story is extremely difficult. Uh, we need to make sure that the brands are very aligned and that they understand exactly uh, the type of audience that we serve. Um, but, you know, it's definitely... Very interesting for us still. I think it's a growing model. Um, I think that the future of ads is about your ability to be able to, uh, to show your audience and give the value to your audience at the same time as the brands and find that sort of balance. And we've been able to do that well. Uh, we're looking into a bunch of different things like how can we actually drive sales and the performance with brands as well. Uh, what type of 360 activations can we do? Can we do offline events to complement what we do online? Uh, so there's tons of different things and avenues that we're exploring. Very cool. And I love that idea that advertising can provide value both for the advertiser and for uh, the audience member. And I think that's what we're finding through IndieGraph with a lot of our um, partner publishers is those local advertisers that are giving information that the audience needs to support their local communities, to engage with events, to, you know, get involved with volunteers. Like there's a lot of different types of advertising that is aligned with that, that core mission of journalism of building community, right? Um, Farhan, um, one question that I have for you. So you came from the Daily Hive where, um, you know, you did a lot of chasing clicks, right? I think that's fair to say. Um, and, you know, left and decided to do, um, uh, to do overstory media and, and take a totally different approach. You guys have the goal of, of having 50 community um, publishers across Canada. Um, and yeah, I'm just curious, like, can you share, um, you know, what it was that, um, that, you know, compelled you to switch from that previous model to this model? And you know you are doing advertising and newsletters. Like, how is that different from what you were doing before? Yeah. So, so first, I'll I'll just say it definitely wasn't chasing clicks. Um, it, it, the monetization game was very different. And that's the way that you look. Like everything that we look at is 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 around how are we making money. And so in the past, and very much like, like what Chuck is doing, you're monetizing by, by getting ad revenue that's coming in. That's one component of it. And in order to get more ad revenue, you need more page views. If you get more page views, you need more content. So like that's the cycle that you're playing on that side, or one of the cycles, I should say. Um, I took a very different approach. And one of the things that for me kind of go back into my, my childhood, everything about what we did and, and how we grew up was around how to make an impact in the community. And how do you go really, really deep? And so the approach that we've taken is a little bit different. And rather than asking questions like, how much money can we make? We ask, how much money do we need to make? If we're gonna go into a market that has three journalists, well, we don't need to be making hundreds of thousands of dollars every single month. You need to cover your expenses plus a little bit on top so you can grow. And so that fundamental change helped to change everything and, and the way that we approach things. So you know, what, what it's allowed us to do is it changes the people that we're working with. It changes the quantity of brands that we're looking to work with. It changes the, every single number. So when we're going into a market and you say, okay, if we've got, uh, let's say five people that are working um, and you've got a little bit on admin and a little bit on this and that, you're really talking about, okay, maybe you've got thirty, forty thousand $40,000 of expenses every single month. That's the number that we need to achieve. We need a break even. We want to be sustainable. And that's the goal is we want to create a sustainable news ecosystem. Um, and, and so 
we ask those questions like how many brands do we need to provide? How money do we need to be making and and it and it allows us to say let's actually look at things and ask uh instead of saying we need 100 brands to work with we need 10 or 20. um we need to uh we need to be uh instead of charging thousands of dollars every single month maybe that number is a little bit lower so it's allowed us to really like you know i say fundamentally change things is because that's that's literally what it is um, with this mindset that how are we going to be around in 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now? Uh, you know, people say that it's crazy. People say, you know, look at the next two, three, four, five years. And it's like, yeah, we need to. But our mission, our goal is to have a deep impact in communities that starts with hiring the best people from communities who know those communities inside and out. You get them to create the content. You, you get them to basically do everything that they need to do. And we're there as a support mechanism to allow them to do that. And so when you when you get to do that, you see you see changes in communities. You see the impact that's being had. Um, and the example I'll use is uh, almost a year ago, there was mass flooding that hit the Fraser Valley here in BC. And the Fraser Valley was is, is kind of a news desert. And so at the time, we had three reporters uh, and what they did day in day out almost you know 20 hours a day they started reporting stories that no one else was reporting they were going and sending out emails late at night they were they were staying on top of everything to the point that we had readers that were coming in saying if it wasn't for you my family wouldn't be safe if it wasn't for you my home wouldn't be safe if it wasn't for you i don't know where i would be today and so all that is is you know so much better than than even money on its own and, and you look at that and say, how do we continue doing that? How can we go that deep into a community that you're having life changing experiences and creating life changing, uh, you know, journalism effectively, um, but everything stems around that. So it's going as deep as we can. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd love to build on that, Farhan. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'm hearing from um, um, from several of you is this idea that you know, we can really, we have the flexibility within our models to focus on impact um, over profit, right? Um, and of course, this is a key difference between the folks in this room and um, say, post media, which is, um, you know, held by uh, a, a big hedge fund in the States or public media organizations that have to prioritize profit to, to serve public shareholders. One of the questions that we have here from our audience um, is, um, uh, how how have we how how did you finance that earlier stage of your organization when you were starting up? And I'd like to bring that forward now to ask you you all like how how are how did you finance the beginning and how did that change what you can do? I think the fact that we're um, a nonprofit and three private organizations um, gives us more flexibility than we might have otherwise. So Farhan, maybe you can build on that a little bit. Like you're saying, you guys need to be sustainable. Um, you know, you've obviously invested millions of dollars into getting to where you are in the last um, year. How would that work <laughs> if there's not a return there to give back <laughs> to um, your funders? Can you just unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So, so I will say we uh, we are self funded. Um, I, I like to say we're bootstrapped, except that's not that's not really the entire story. Uh, my partner Andrew Wilkinson is someone who has deep care for for his community. He's the one that actually started our first publication, Capital Daily, our flagship, and and he's someone who's done very well um, in uh, in in the private space and now public space a little bit. Um, and and one of the things that we kind of came together was we said, look, we need to be able to fund this. We need to be able to go and hire really good people. We need to change the model and change the thinking that. Uh, that you know, let's set our goals higher. Let's go and let's go and try to build something. And so we did that, and and we said, okay, but here's our goal. Our goal isn't to spend all of this money and go nowhere. Our goal really is we want to get to that sustainability. Let's put a time frame within there. Let's try to do that. And so that's how a lot of that's happened. Uh, I think very fortunate. Um, when I left my previous company, uh, I wanted to get out of media. I said, I don't want to do this anymore. This is a this is an exhausting game to play. Um, but when that opportunity came up and those conversations happened, the way that I that I said it is the only way I'm going to do this is if there is some money to get this off the ground, um, because I know what it's like to bootstrap. I know what it's like to go to go in like, you know, really, really struggle through it. So we're still operating with that same mentality, still trying to be scrappy, still trying to do as many things as we can. But at the same time, we're also looking at to say, uh, you know, in order to get to that point a year or two years, three years later, 
we have to invest. And so when we go into communities, we're generally investing anywhere from two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars a year. And, and all with this goal that we want to be at a break even by year two, we want to be profitable by year three. And when I say profitable, it's not making, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. It's so that we can go and invest back in so that we can go hire another person. So we're going to start with a team of two, four people, we want to bring on another one. We want to bring on another one. But we also know that there is, uh, there's only so much that we're going to grow um, because our goal isn't to make, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. It's to have that impact in the communities. Yeah. Chuck, would you be able to share a little bit about how you all got launched and how you've been able to finance your growth? Yeah, it was definitely the most stressful period of my life. Uh, when I started the business in 2013, uh, I actually had to personally bankroll uh, my partner um, and I did not have any money in the bank. Uh, I was essentially going on a credit line. So everything is bootstrapped and personally financed. Um, I would say that it if I were to have the opportunity to do it again, I, I would definitely do like Farhan is saying, make sure that you have some money in the bank, make sure that you have the proper partners. I think that when, or at least with our model, when we're trying to build a company in media and you're competing versus the giants that have existed for hundreds of years, um, you really have to be extremely, extremely nimble both with your money and your expenses, but also with the performance and your staff and how you make the decisions that impact everyday work. So we started, you know, I will not lie in saying that we came very close to shutting down the doors many times. Um, we had a personal investor that believed in us in 2014 that injected a small amount of money. Uh, but a part of that essentially we, we are self-financed. Um, I wouldn't say again, I wouldn't say it's the best of things. I think that now we're struggling to do, to sort of see how we can get a lot more uh, capital to be able to grow faster because we're working with the banks and the traditional partners where for them, me the media industry is not necessarily the most sexy industry to invest in. Um, so we have to, to work with the, the partners that we've been working with, but also as well, try to convince investors in the future that there's, a future in this industry that we're doing amazing things and that you know it's worth investing in. So definitely it was not easy, uh, but uh, you know I would do it again. Awesome, Emma. Do you want to jump in? I know your financing story would have been very different. Yeah, for sure. So we I was just doing the math, um, and in that first year of the Narwhal 2018, only about 20% of our revenue came from readers. Um, so it was definitely he more heavily weighted to the foundation side of things. Um, Carol and I had been running like a passion project before the Narwhal, which we had built a big audience through and that we basically like converted into the Narwhal. So it's always like a part of the story I like to share because we definitely got started with like, we had like a supercharger underneath us, right? We already had a big Facebook following. We already had a decent sized newsletter list. And then we just flipped it into a, you know, beautiful brand and website and it, you know, it took off from there. Um, but basically the, that early funding would be the story of like building it up through a passion project beforehand, um, and foundation funding to start. And also just having a really small budget. Like we, I've seen a lot of outlets start over the years and have these like super grand ambitions and like go really big and hire a ton of people. And we just started off pretty slow, really, for the first couple of years. Um, we only had two staff for like over a year. Um, and then we grew to four. And then, you know, after two years, we grew to eight. So I guess that is part of being not for profit is there isn't that like expectation to create, you know, to grow super fast and to, um, you know, create that profit. But we always paid ourselves like neither Carol or I were ever in a position to a, we had no money um, and we couldn't afford to work for no money. Uh, sometimes people are kind of asked like, oh, wow, like how did you, you know, take that risk? That was really brave. But the reality is like, we didn't really have much to lose um, because like what else I was going to go like work at the Victoria Times colonist for the rest of my life or like what, like what was the other option? Um, and we were always in the position 
that we were paying ourselves. So um, thankfully we, you know, we're able to bring in enough just to kind of break even for those first years. That's amazing. I love the scrappiness <laughs> um, with everyone and uh, definitely a theme. And I guess like one question I have for you all, and I'll, I'll throw this to Brandy first is, is like, obviously in all of these circumstances, there's limited resources. There's only so much that you can do. Your ambitions are bigger than um, what you're able to do at any given time. Even, you know, if you have 50 or hundred employees, I'm sure you still feel that way. Um, so how do you determine where to put those resources? Um, so in the case of, of Dispersed Community Publishing, um, you all just launched a new publication in Kamloops. Um, what were the steps that you took to determine whether, um, whether there was a demand there, whether you can make an impact there? Um, and, you know, what, is there any metrics that you look to to sort of understand whether there genuinely is a gap where you can succeed? Um, yeah, Brandy, what, what's, what's the process? Yeah, I think the process of in Kamloops and specifically with the REN has been a very long process, although we have just started um, publishing regularly, you know, I think in, in June, um, it was many, many years of me trying to, um, you know, get, get the resources to do it, but also to validate my hunch that it could work there. And so Kamloops is a little bit of a different type of, um, of market. There's actually quite a bit of quite a few journalists there. There's quite a few digital outlets that are working. Um, and they're working under a like really, um, I would say heavily digital advertising based models. And so we came in with the idea that a different model could allow us to do a different type of work that wasn't being done in the community. And so we did a lot of stakeholder engagement um, we used kind of, you know, every every trick in the book to connect with audiences, um, potential readers, different organizations in Kamloops through things like surveys, um, you know, coffee chats, um, you know, just pretty much any type of way that we could connect with people and pick their brains. And that included people in the existing media industry there, but as well as readers and people from different communities who, you know, maybe weren't getting the type of attention that they should have in the media there. Um, so it was a lot of work to, to validate, um, what I had, what I had thought and what I had hoped. And so what we're seeing now is that, um, our newsletter list is growing, you know, extremely quickly. And, you know, one metric that we can use for that is, you know, cost per lead and our cost per lead right now is, is quite low. And so we know that there's an appetite and that people are really, um, you know, interested in more in-depth work than can be produced under the other models. So, and we're also getting lots of just like emails back from folks that, um, you know, we've been waiting for something like this. We're so excited for something like this. Um, we really love what you've been doing so far. So all of those get kind of tucked away into, you know, a special impact channel in Slack that we go look at if we're feeling a little bit blue. <laughs> And uh, we're getting ready to launch our first um, founding members campaign uh, coming up in October. So that will really be like the moment where um, we learn if it's really going to be a go or not. That's interesting. And um, Emma, one of the questions that we have from the audience here, um, oh, just as an aside, uh, I will start to pull in the audience questions now. So if you have any, please uh, share them with us um, via Zoom. Um, is uh, at what point did you start asking users to pay for your content? And I think um, going back to the original question of like, how are you judging, you know, where there is demand for your work? Um, maybe you can share a little bit about the campaign that you did in Ontario to sort of gauge that demand before you, you brought in resources. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, we were able to basically like, you know, it was a fairly educated guess that based on the success we'd had in Western Canada that, you know, we, there would be an audience for, for the Narwhal in Ontario because there was no one really doing that type of journalism there. And so one of the first things we did though was launch a campaign to get 10,000 people to sign up for our newsletter um, to show, you know, that there was that interest before launching the new bureau. Um, and yeah, I think that's really important. We actually copied that off you guys <laughs> at the discourse. Um, flattery is the highest form of phrase and all our imitation is the highest form of flattery and all that. Um, cause I saw you do that in, um, Nanaimo 
And I just, you know, I think it's a great like engagement tactic and it's a really good way to create a sense of urgency and meaning around signing up for a newsletter, um, which I, I personally have found. So I, I worked in the traditional news world and then I went into the nonprofit world and then I, you know, came to the Narwhal and fundraising for the Narwhal is really easy compared to fundraising in other sectors because the product is, you know, really obvious. It's very tangible. It's very, you know, specific. It's right in front of you. Um, but what I find a little bit harder is that list building. It's getting people to sign up for a newsletter, right? Like how do you make that it urgent, sexy thing? Whereas in the nonprofit sector, it can be a petition, right? It can be very advocacy oriented. Um, so I think that those like launch campaigns, it's a way to make signing up for a newsletter um, a sexy thing. And it's also a way to measure the actual appetite in, in that market. Farhan, how are you guys determining which markets um, seem to be a viable fit for your model? Uh, so we, we've got one of these like really simple flow charts and we'll look at things and we'll say, okay, kind of this path, I think of three different options. Number one, uh, is there something that exists? If the answer is no, then okay, let's go create something. Um, but then further, are there people that, that exist there that could be doing this and doing the work? Um, the other options are, is there something that, that exists? And when the answer is yes, we go down two different roads. Number one, is it something good enough? Is it something that is creating enough value for the community? If the answer is no, then we go and we we go down that path. Um, and then the other side is, you know, if there's something that's good enough, then we kind of leave it alone. Um, or we look and we say, well, if there's something that exists, maybe it's not good enough, maybe it is, could we throw some fuel on this? Could we streamline some back office support? Uh, maybe we go and acquire it and we can build on top of it. So it's uh, it's definitely not a perfect model. I remember when we started, I had this list of like 50 markets across Canada and everything from like tiny little 50,000 person town all the way up to like a million plus. Uh, but one of the biggest things that I learned along the way is that because we're so heavily reliant on people and, and journalists and content creators, um, that changed the way that we were thinking. So we threw that kind of playbook, so to say, out the window. And we said, let's just go with the flow and see what happens. And, uh, and sometimes you're going to land one, sometimes you're not. We put feelers out all over the place. And so what it's, uh, what it's been able to do is actually give me some, some really good insight into what's happening around the country and, and what's going on. And the biggest thing that I'll say is that there are so many people that are trying different things across the country. And a lot of them are working, a lot of them are not, and, and a lot of them are struggling. But it's just showing the fact that there is so much opportunity, there's so much potential here, if we think of it differently. Uh, our smallest market is, is in a, a, a neighborhood in a, in a city that's 20,000. Um, you know, just because it's a small town, just because it's a small neighborhood doesn't mean that there is an opportunity, doesn't mean that there's that there aren't stories to share. And I think that's the that's the that's the big difference that you'll probably get with all of us here is that, you know, we're not these big guys that are coming in thinking we just want to come in biggest populations, biggest eyeballs, biggest everything. Um, but it's it's in fact the opposite. So uh, I don't know if that answers it. But um, yeah. That's really interesting, um, uh, Farhan, just about that, like one of the most important things being that the community really identifies with itself. That's something that we found in the public, uh, amongst the publishers that we support at IndieGraph as well. Um, size is less important than um, identity and engagement. Um, I just wanted to, um, so we were talking before the call about this piece of news that came out yesterday. So I just wanted to put this out here. Um, and uh, so Zoomer Media announces that uh, it acquired Daily High. Uh, so this is interesting because there's pretty rare that you see a big media deal happen in Canada. Um, so I'll just read a little bit here. Uh, the purchase price was $16.4 million um, that Zoomer Media paid uh, for Daily Hive. And, and this um, makes uh, Zoomer Media um, have a national platform. I'm, I'm really curious what you all think about this. Uh, what does this tell us about the potential of, uh, of what's happening in the industry right now? Um, and yeah, just, just um, you know, bouncing off your last comment, Chuck, I'll, I'll throw it to you first. You said, you know, it is important for us to show that this can work and convince investors that there's a business here. So 
is this, does this help this or does this hurt this? What do you think? I definitely think it helps. Um, I think if you just look at the valuation that they attributed and that they purchased the business for, you're talking about uh, two point, close to 2.5x on the revenue, uh, which is last year's revenue. Uh, so that is extremely uh, good. Um, I think that I think that there's potentially the misconception in the traditional investment world, or at least in Canada. I don't think that these types of deals happen often in Canada. Um, and I think that they will start to happen much more often. And if you look at the U.S. and what happens there, um, you know, you used to have the golden age where, you know, BuzzFeed and Vice and bigger players in the U.S. would get massive uh, rounds of investment. Um, and I think that kind of faded out. As you can see, BuzzFeed is trading at roughly uh, one half of their revenue, which is if you compare it to the daily high purchase, it's quite uh intense um but i do think that the, that this this show, shows to the entire industry that there's clearly a demand here that there's a future in the business um and that there's lots of moves to, to do and and play with so i think that, that that this is a great news for the industry yeah i uh i love that you threw to buzzfeed and and vice there and these sort of like big bubble valuations that there were for a time um, it seems like there is uh, interest right now, um, but it's a little bit more rooted in the actual business fundamentals rather than these ideas about the future where they have, you know, are valuing it on these massive user bases that when they haven't figured out the revenue yet. Uh, another deal that I got excited about um, from last month was the Axios uh, acquisition. Of course, this is in the U.S., so a much larger market. But again, they were able to sell to a, um, a private company that has been involved in newspapers. So um, for five times revenue um, multiple, and that was a half billion dollar deal. So um, this is a new company that's only three years old. That's that's like you know building value by directly serving people um, with local community news. So that felt um, like a really um, exciting signal as well. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what you as as a, a former Daily Hive co-owner, uh, Farhan. I'm curious your thoughts and. And also just the, the investment market, um, you know, due to a, a scoop by another one of our uh, colleagues uh, in independent, well, in startup media, I don't know if we call them independent, David Scott over at The Logic. Um, we know that um, that uh, Overstory Media has also recently been raising capital in this environment. Um, and I'm just really curious, how is that going? How are you convincing investors? What can you share about that? Um, and how do you reconcile um, the... Uh, the pressure to give returns with your vision of sustainability, um, you know, only having small margins to reinvest into growth. Yeah, uh, lot, lots of things there. Um, I, I think first off, the, the sale is great. Uh, it's great news for both the industry along with the team there. Um, I was there for most of the past decade. And so seeing uh, what I used to call my little baby grow up and uh, and and sell for you know uh, what eight figures is is pretty remarkable. Um, I think it's really interesting when you look at what Zoomer as a whole is doing. They they now have paid over thirty million dollars for two properties, one in BlogTO, the other in Daily Hive, and really focused on on those big eyeballs and and trying to get as much reach and all that. And so it it definitely. Um, I would say it almost it, it shrinks the market down a little bit and shows that um, that that's one tier, that's one level. Uh, I still think that there's massive opportunity in like these really hyper local markets going down into these different niches, um, and so and so I'm really excited about that. Um, in terms of you know investment and whatnot, uh, I think this year has definitely made things very tricky for everyone, and the way that the markets have been going has really shaken everything. I know we've, we've even had advertising partners who seemed like a shoe in or had or were spending with us. And because of the way things have turned, they've they've kind of turned things off and they've had to cancel contracts. And so we've gone down that path. And I'm sure um, anyone who's who has advertising is, is has been dealing with that is generally in, uh, you know, when as soon as people hear the word recession, uh, they cut advertising spend. So it, it forces us to be creative, forces us to think a little bit differently. 
Um, for us as a, as an organization, we've been looking and saying, you know, from day one, we've said, we want to expand. We've said, we want to be sustainable. Um, when we, when we're, when we're looking to grow, when we're looking to bring on different investments, um, everything is around, around value alignment. And so I am always the first one to say, uh, you know, we are not looking to make rate crazy profits. We are not looking to do that sort of thing. Um, and, and part of it is because of the partnership that myself and Andrew have and the thinking that we bring to this is that if we do things a little bit differently, if we focus on that long term sustainability, um, you know, we have we have investigative journalists on the team that their their own their only goal is to go and create uh, deeper, deeper stories and tell some of the best stories and uncover the craziest stuff that's happening. And we're investing heavily into that. And so we're looking for, for different people. We're looking for different organizations that want that same thing and aren't looking for much of a return. And I think this is, this is the, the land of opportunity right now, when it comes to local, when it comes to different niche interests is that no one else is really doing it. We go into markets generally, you uh, kind of going back to the question before um, we go into markets where we're kind of going up against one of the old guys and so right now i know we're head to head in in places where black press is there Post media is there glaciers there uh and and salt wire uh out, out in the east and so we're we're up against that like that's the that's the behemoth that's the elephant that's sitting in the room um and every single person is saying the same thing which is it's just not good enough uh, people who work there say the same things. People who work there leave there and come over to, to people like us and, and the rest of the, the, the team here. So it's definitely just this, this land of opportunity if, if that value aligns and if you're thinking around that same thing. And, and if, and, and I sound like a broken record all the time, but you know, if you're all about having deep impact in the communities and actually want to create content that is phenomenal, that people actually want to read and consume, that actually will have uh will we'll change policy decision makers and and things like that if you want all that it's all possible uh, one of the things that i remember hearing so much was you, we 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 create 10 percent or sorry we create 90 percent of the of the crap so we can we can do the 10 percent that we really care about and we said well what if we flipped it what if we said do a hundred percent of the stuff that you care about and that others care about what if what, what would happen and so we've seen that, you know, our flagship Capital Daily, it's a profitable publication. We have, I think, almost 10 people working on that thing now. And it's been around for about three and a half years, uh, I think actually almost four years. Um, it, you know, it, it's that kind of thing that if we say this is our goal, this is our mission, we're going to focus so hard on these few things. We do not care about anything else. Uh, the tough thing is obviously finding the people in the organizations who want to come along for that ride. But the beauty is that there are people that exist and they're out there and they want to come on board because there's nothing else that exists or it's just not good enough. Thank you. I love that. So I think it was a uh, it was an aha moment for me working at Discourse Media when I realized the membership pitch is the same thing as the advertiser pitch is the same thing as the investment pitch. And we need to do good work and invite people to be part of that in different ways. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I love that. I love that answer. Um, so we just have a few minutes left here. So I want to invite you all just to uh, offer some final comments and, and specifically like, what do you see for the future of your organizations? Um, I think one of the things we don't talk about as much in news entrepreneurship is what is the end game? How, do, you know, <laughs> entrepreneurship is this lovely, like, freeing, independent um, uh, job that you can't quit, right? <laughs> so um, I'm just curious, like, how are you seeing the future for yourself? Um, it's a lot, right? Like, it's caring a lot. I mean, Chuck, you're talking about how stressful that was starting your organization using credit at the beginning. Um, you know, I'm really, um, I was really, really moved, Emma, by the piece that you shared on, in the Globe last week about some of the personal things going on in your life at the same time as growing this extremely fast growing organization. Um, you know, it's a lot to be an entrepreneur. So how are you thinking about the future of your career and what comes next and what is in the future? Whoever's ready to jump in first, I'll let you pass it. I can hop in. That's such sure. a big question. I don't know that I fully have the answer to that. Um, but I will say what I'm thinking for the Canadian kind of news landscape. And I think similarly, like to the excitement around investment in, you know, private news companies, I think there should be a lot of excitement around the nonprofit news sector as well. There's a huge untapped opportunity for nonprofit news in Canada. 
in the U.S., there's over 300 nonprofit news organizations, you know, really big ones like ProPublica um, and Reveal and, you know, in lots of investigative news that is produced out of those outlets. Some of them have over 100 full-time staff. Um, and it's only in the last year and a half, really, that we've seen the kind of tax law in Canada change that enables large-scale philanthropy in Canada for journalism. And I think you know, success both in the nonprofit sector and in the private sphere just points to the fact that independent journalism is a feasible thing in Canada. Um, and I think there's huge opportunity for philanthropists to have a huge impact by, you know, doing things like providing some startup funding pots of money for folks so that more nonprofit news organizations can get started. Um, I mean, the long game for the Narwhal is just to be a, you know, truly sustainable organization, um, you know, with distributed leadership, um, distributed, you know, diversified sources of revenue. Um, we're pretty much there so that exi it exists long into the future, right? And um, to continue to create an impact in communities and provide news that otherwise wouldn't be provided. I feel like a lot of what we've been talking about reminds me of like, this book I was obsessed with when we were launching the Narwhal, um, which is Good to Great by Jim Collins, and just the whole concept of doing one thing really well. And it's it's so much about that. It's about saying no to a whole bunch of things and finding one thing that you can do better than anybody else in the world and being just ruthlessly dedicated to doing that one thing. Um, and so I think that's been really key to our success is just being strategically focused. And um, that'll probably continue to be the key moving forward. Thank you. Chuck? Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're very ambitious uh, people here, um, but at the same time, we understand that the news industry is so, so, so stressful, and not just for the owners, but for the people on the ground. Um, for us, like just reinvesting in the culture of the business, making sure that people are paid well, that they can afford their lives and their condos. Um, and, just being able to make sure that people are feel good while working in the news industry. Like that for us is a huge, huge, huge focus. Um, how do we do that? We do that by making a bit more money, making sure that we're making a profit and making sure that we're putting less pressure on the staff to meet their numbers, like ultimately, while also making sure that people feel empowered to do their, their best work. Um, so we're definitely excited about the future. We're going to keep expanding into the markets that we're in. We're expanding into the U.S. as well. Um, and I think just in the U.S. is going to be a great opportunity to bring the Canadian benefits uh, life that in the U.S. they don't have at all. Like we've hired a few reporters in the U.S. and just the benefits component is like a massive thing. It's very expensive, but it's, you know, I think that we can bring the sort of mentality and the life that we have here in Canada, in the US. And I think that that's a really positive thing for them. So uh, I think that just building a great culture and a place to work for our people is, de is definitely one of the most important things for us. I love that, making journalism jobs great. It's pretty simple, right? I love that. Brandy. Um, I think I just want to say that I'm so appreciative for these conversations and that research actually shows that the type of solutions that we talk about are the types of solutions that get implemented. And we really have to keep having this conversation um, to really break out of the crisis narrative that has really taken over the journalism. And there's so much energy that we're sensing on the ground right now, you know, when folks like us get together and we talk about what we're doing and the ideas that we have, the successes that we're having, the types of organizations that we want to build to have impact and be amazing places to work. Um, so I just want everybody to, to keep talking about it because it's so exciting and it will have an impact uh, just, just talking about it. I think with discourse, we want to continue being innovative. We want to continue being, you know, the, the test kitchen where we find out what is the secret sauce um, for, for success um, in these communities. And yeah, really similar to Chuck, I really want to make sure that we're building, you know, the best place that we can for folks who work for us um, to do their best work. So, you know, I think part of that is finding the sweet spot of how big you want to be, you know, I think with an entrepreneur, you're always thinking about like, what's next, what's next, but it's, I think it's really like, what is the manageable size, I think is the big question for me going forward. Cool. Um, I'm going to echo all, all of these last, these last 
that's here in terms of trying to change the workplace. Uh, I heard way too often, um, you know, journalism is a place that you will be overworked, underpaid, underappreciated, you will be exhausted. Uh, I know way too many people who are in their 20s and 30s who were in the industry for a number of years and said, I'm, I'm ready to leave and go do something else. Um, one of the goals that we have is to fundamentally change that and make journalism, make community news and reporting a place that is a lifelong career and that you will always see forward progression. You will always be able to have that impact. Um, th the second one is, is a bit of a, a longer play, a little bit of a bigger mission, which is that we want to try. Uh, we want to try and, and change things. We want to try and build. Um, our sites are on 50 years down the road. We want to be in all of these different communities around the country and even beyond the country. And I think, uh, I think that kind of thinking is something that, that, that not enough have. We're all short-sighted. We're all thinking about, you know, what are the next few years look like? Uh, I remember vividly asking a, a politician, uh, you know, what do they, for, what do they want to their vision for Canada in the next 50 years? And, and they said, well, let's talk about the next four years. And I was like, of course, you're going to bring it back to the next four years. So it's this longer term thinking that, you know, let's focus on value. Let's focus on impact. Let's have these communities run by people in those communities. Let's see if we can make a fundamental difference. Um, but at the end of the day, let's try. Uh, if we fail, at least we try. But all things are leading to success. Um, let's continue doing that and, and trying to have, make an impact. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Farhan. And um, yeah, everything you said all really resonates with me at IndieGraph, where focus, our like central um, strategic goal is also to make news entrepreneurship a great career and life choice. That's our like guiding uh, North Star. And so um, we hope that there will be a lot more folks that can be on this panel in the future. Um, thank you so much, Emma, Chuck, Farhan, Brandy. I've learned so much from your insights and experiences today. I really appreciate you spending your time with us. And thanks to everyone who joined us and those who submitted questions. I'm so sorry we couldn't make it through more of them. It was a lively uh, group of questions that was coming in. Um, uh, the CJF JChalk Live returns this Thursday at the same time with uh, the next uh, version of this, of this startup focus, the new wave, uh, which will focus on, on, some, on some journalists, entrepreneurs who are a little bit earlier in their career, uh, in their process. Um, and a reminder that you can find the videos and podcasts of past talks on the CJF site. And to stay up to date on CJF events, sign up for the newsletter or follow the Canadian Journalism Foundation on social media. Thank you all so much for watching.